Hi, I'm Kevin Williams of Survival Skills Rider Training, and for the next few minutes, I'm going to be taking you through my Science of Being Seen presentation. So with no more ado, let's get on with the show. The UK has a long history of Think Bike campaigns aimed at car drivers. The idea was to make them more aware of motorcycles on the roads and to reduce the number of collisions that occurred at junctions. Um, however, the sad fact is that uh, though there is some evidence that they've had limited effect, it doesn't seem to last and collisions at junctions are just as common as they ever were here in the UK. Um, and drivers basically still don't see motorcycles. But first, a little bit of history to science of being seen. My own background starts with a science master's degree, but I've had many practical years of riding experience as a courier. And since 1995, I've been a qualified bike trainer. I've worked with a number of organisations to promote better biking skills, including writing a column for the Motorcycle Action Group, working on safety interventions with Somerset Road Safety and Buckinghamshire County Council, and researching and designing a series of cartoons for the European Motorcycle Manufacturers Association. Science of Being Seen was originally put together over the winter of 2011 for Kent Fire and Rescue for use in their award-winning Biker Down course. And I personally have delivered the presentation to many riding groups here in the UK, but also out in New Zealand for the Department of Transport on their Shiny Side Up Rider Safety Initiative. There are, in fact, a number of different mechanisms for these collisions. Um, the first thing to say is that a significant number of crashes, one in five, happen when the motorcycle simply wasn't where the driver could see it. Perhaps the motorcycle was filtering or lane splitting or um, something we'll talk about in a moment, the bodywork of the car actually obscured the driver's view. Um, a second group of collisions, uh, the looked but failed to see, um, and what I call look but for forgot crashes, accounts for around about one in three collisions. Um, we'll have a look at those in a little bit more detail too. And then there's a third group of crashes, uh, which is also around about one in three collisions, where the driver actually saw the bike and misjudged its speed and distance. And we'll look for reasons that happens as well. And everything else accounts for around about 8% of all collisions. So less than one in 10, in fact. So these crashes really aren't driver didn't look so much as driver looked, but something went wrong. And our job is to try to understand what it was that went wrong. Now, here's the first problem to think about. It's the structure of the car. Um, anything that blocks the driver's view is an issue. It could be pedestrians at the side of the road. It could be other vehicles. Um, it could be a hedgerow or a, a tree line. Um, but one of the problems which seems to be growing in terms of um, how serious it is, is simply the the thickness of the pillars supporting the windscreen and to a lesser extent the ones between the doors as well. Um, these pillars are getting thicker and thicker and thicker uh, to give the car additional rollover protection. Um, they also are the location in mo the more recent cars for airbags and even sometimes for um, high-end uh, audio systems in the car as well. So I've pinched a, uh, a, a photo here from a car magazine and what you'll see is between 18, uh, 1980 and 2005, you'll see that the pillar got thicker and thicker. Well, we've got 15 more years of car development since then, and I can tell you that the average car now has an even thicker pillar. And a good way to visualize this is to put your hand up at about uh, the distance um, your arm is, and that is roughly the distance from your driving seat where your head is to the pillar on the side of the windscreen nearest to yourself. Um, and the palm of your hand is actually about the thickness of that pillar. 
Um, so what I'm going to get you to do is uh, hold your hands up and cover up the X on the screen. So if you've got your hands up and you're covering that X up, watch carefully. When did you actually see that motorcycle appear? The motorcycle can hardly be described as hard to see. It's a, sort of a British police motorcycle, fairly obviously, um, in high vis and with its lights on. So you'd have to say that's a fairly visible bike, but it took a long time for that motorcycle to actually appear around the pillar. Um, go outside, have a look at your own bike um, and do that trick with your hand held up and walk up to your own motorcycle and see just how close you can get before the bike actually emerges from around it. You'll be quite frightened, I would imagine, by just how close you can actually walk to a motorcycle. Okay, so if sometimes the bike simply can't be seen, sometimes the driver looks for it but fails to see it. And there are a number of reasons for this. And one is connected to the, um, the narrow zone of clear visual focus that we have in the human eye. Um, we tend to think that we've got wraparound color vision. We haven't, we've actually got a pinpoint focus. Um, and here's another little trick that you can do. Hold your hand up, um, put your thumb up as I've done here. Um, look at your top knuckle and then move your eye up to your fingernail, your thumbnail. And what you'll find is you actually do have to physically move your eyes to change your point of gaze. That should give you an idea how tightly focused our zone of clear color vision is, the foveal zone as it's known. Um, have a look at the motorcycle on the picture there. The problem here is that if we are focused on the motorcycle, the car next to it is blurry and out of sight. And that's actually what happens in peripheral vision. Although we're quite sensitive to light and dark contrast and motion out here, we don't see things in clear vision. And, and peripheral vision extends a lot, lot closer to our foveal zone than we realize. So if the driver switched his viewpoint across to the mini that you can see in the picture there, the motorcycle itself would be out of focus. Yep. On the 5th of March 1936, the Spitfire prototype K5054 made its first ever flight from the Supermarine Works at East Lynn, Southern England, heralding the start of a legend that is just as powerful today as it was during those dark years of World War II. And this is uh, an illustration of exactly what I mean. All the way through that clip, we were focused on the speaker's face, Alan de Cadenet's face. That's what we're looking at. That's where our attention is drawn. And it's only when the camera actually pans sideways across the shot that we are mentally refocused on looking at the background. Um, and how close did the Spitfire actually get before you saw it? Um, the thing is, it can actually, it gets surprisingly close before it actually pops out of the background. And that is a problem known as motion camouflage. With no lateral movement, with the aircraft simply flying directly towards our line of sight, it's actually very, very difficult to spot. And the Spitfire is a lot bigger than a motorcycle. Even though we can hear it, we can't see it. And this throws some light on collisions uh, at junctions, um, particularly where two vehicles are moving towards the same spot. So there'll be a giveaway junction or possibly with two straight roads approaching it and two vehicles are coming towards the spot and they meet at the same moment. And because they're on what's known as constant bearing, there's no lateral movement across the background to draw the uh, either driver or possibly even motorcyclist's attention to the other vehicle. And that's known to be a specific problem on junctions like that. Okay, it gets more complicated still. Um, if you know anything about ballet dancing, um, you will probably be aware that um, ballet dancers, ice dancers, when they are rotating, what they do is they focus their eyes on one particular point on the background. It's called spotting. And they do that for a very good reason. When they turn their head, they turn their head more quickly than their body goes around. And that spinning 
would otherwise upset their vision. If it wasn't for one thing, they exploit something called saccadic masking. As the vision blurs across our background because we are turning our head, it actually shuts down and we are able to maintain our balance better. If we have blurry motion across our eyes, we actually get some travel sick. That's one of the reasons for travel sickness. So um, think about what the driver does at a junction, looks one way, looks the other way, turns his head quite quickly. And what you'll find is that if you do it yourself, you will probably even blink in the middle of that head movement. So far from getting a scan across the entire uh, sort of road between the two points at either end of our view, we actually shut down most of the vision. So what we see is actually more akin to the photograph that I've got there with those sort of vertical black blinds on it. And the faster we turn our head, the thicker the blinds get and the fewer the gaps where we have actual visual information uh, become. We end up more or less with just two snapshots at either end and maybe a couple of points in the middle. So the trick is to actually slow down your scan so that you open those windows as it were up. So that is known as motion, uh, sorry, as a saccadic masking. Um, we have an allied problem to that and that's a, something we actually learn to do uh, on bikes or on, in cars and that's to look for gaps at either end of the uh, area that we want to get out into. We search for gaps, we see one in one direction, one in the other, and then we work out they'll meet in the middle. And then we do a quick double check, and that's when the saccadic masking kicks in, and a bike that was probably in clear sight goes missing. And then it gets a little bit more complicated still. Um, we have a problem with the brain's ability to identify and retain information. Simple as that. Um, it's called a workload problem. Um, where our brains were simply never designed for driving vehicles and there's simply too much going on. In a picture like uh, the one in front, you've got traffic lights, you've got filters, um, some vehicles are stopping, some are going, some are turning, and we're trying to monitor all that and find our way at the same time. Um, on top of that, we find that the brain, some really late, uh, up to the minute information, the brain seems to have a kind of first in, first out memory buffer. So visual th um, inputs, things that we actually see in one uh, at one moment, then get shuffled forward through this memory buffer by new bits of information. And eventually they fall out the other side. It seems we can store about six bits of visual information at the same time. So if we happen to see six cars after we first spotted a motorcycle, we forget the motorcycle was spotted. As far as the brain's concerned, it was never there. And of course, this is made more likely by the fact that uh, motorcycles are massively outnumbered on the road, as in the picture in front of you there on screen. Okay, um, how do we manage to misjudge speed and distance? Well, the answer is um, connected with the size and shape of a motorcycle. Um, that particular still is taken from a very old Think Bike video in England, but it um, uh, illustrates the problem uh, perfectly. The car is fairly squat and wide, but the motorcycle is narrow and fairly tall. And for some reason, objects that are squat and wide, we're much better able to identify their speed and distance than things that are tall and thin. And drivers generally underestimate the speed of a motorcycle. They overestimate its distance. So they think they've got time to pull out and then they find they haven't. And this error is actually more likely to happen on faster roads. Okay, now what about the theories about what would make us more visible? Now, this has been termed the magpie theory because magpies are attracted to bright objects. So the idea was drivers would be. And the picture there is taken from an old edition of the UK's Highway Code. And you'll see that uh, what was being frowned on was a black rider in black leathers uh, with the light switched off on the motorcycle. And what was recommended was to use a light colored helmet, light colored clothing and to turn the lights on. Uh, did it work? Well, have a look at this picture here. Um, on the left hand side, you'll see a perfectly visible black motorcycle and black rider. And on the 
other side of the screen, the right hand side, you'll see a couple of policemen in high vis clothing who have blended beautifully into the yellow foliage behind them. And the answer is, of course, that bright colours like bright satin yellow only work if they contrast with the background behind. If you get the colour that you're, the clothing you're wearing to match the colour behind you, you're creating what's known as contrast camouflage. So we've known about that for quite a long time. Oops, wrong button, try the other one. Okay, so there's a nice high-vis tiger, bright orange colours uh, with black stripes. Uh, what do we know about tigers in the jungle? They go missing. The outline of the animal is broken up by the vertical stripes and in the, the sort of dappled light behind them, they will become invisible. Have a look at the picture there and think what is being done by that uh, high-vis colour scheme. Um, it actually slices up the outline of the bike very neatly so you can no longer see there's a motorcycle, you just get patches of bright and dark and the riders H belts pretty much do the same thing to their own body. That's one of the uh, police forces in the UK. Most police forces have, have given up using that colour scheme because it turned out to be uh, ineffective in the wrong kind of light. Okay, so what about lights? Well, the trouble with the, uh, the day riding light, the using the low beam, is that the light is angled down away from the observer. That's what it's supposed to do. So we can't actually see it very clearly. Um, the second problem was uh, here is reflective clothing. Um, we were told that again that reflective material would be good so most of the kind of bike kit that you see has the reflective material high up on the shoulders, on the chest, on the back and that's exactly what we have here. We have the standard traffic vest um, and you'll notice that it simply doesn't get lit up by a dipped headlight, a low beam from the motorcycle behind. But what does get lit up are the two reflective patches on my aero stitch trouser legs. Um, so if you think about uh, that rider being illuminated by a car in front of him coming the other way, again, that reflective material would be ineffective. And we've also got a junction on the near side there, uh, the, the accident that we're always afraid of and if you ask yourself where are the headlights from that vehicle if there was a vehicle there pointing they'd be right across the road in front of the motorcycle none of the light falls on the rider's shoulders where his reflective material is so we can put um, lots of lights we can put light colored motorcycles we can put light colored helmets together and basically what happens is that the conspicuity varies literally on a meter by meter basis. Um, at the back of the bike there's black um, silhouetted so it's, it's fairly visible. Front of the bike it just blends in to the lights of the building in front. Okay so what else do we know about um, the um, high vis. Well, a lot of the research was actually done by the military and this is a Hawk trainer and you'll notice it's black because the black is showing up nicely against the ground. If you look closely, you'll see two ground, clue, uh, ground crew over the nose of the plane who are neatly camouflaged by the yellowy green of the apron. What we actually need to think about is the colour wheel. Um, if you look at the colour wheel and think about typical summer um, foliage colours, they're in the yellowy green areas down towards the bottom right. And the contrasting colour is up towards the top left. It's on the opposite side of the colour wheel. Uh, so the bad news, gentlemen, is that the most effective colour for daytime use in a rural environment is likely to be pink or as I believe you refer to it as man salmon. Um, a good second best would be orange but satin yellow which is usually used as a high vis colour really isn't effective against the sort of yellowy green colours as we've just seen. 
The second point that uh, you would have noticed from that aircraft is it was all black. It was a solid color apart from the logo on the tail fin. So the second recommendation is to try to create a solid shape. Make the bike and the rider the same color. This is a London para medic riding uh, an old style pan and you'll notice that the bike is all yellow the police in the uk have mostly moved to the same pattern and the other thing that they do is they use a jacket with sleeves if the rider there was using a sleeve jacket that would be even better And you can do the same at night. Um, you can now buy reflective jackets, which actually give the whole uh, of the jacket uh, reflective ability rather than those little patches. And they're much easier to see than those bands and stripes that we wear up on our shoulders. Um, if you really want to go the whole hog on the pink, uh, that's Danny ja John Jules, uh, English TV star. He's the uh, uh, Death in Paradise actor uh, or Red Dwarf, you may know him for too. Um, but on the other hand, you may think that that's probably going uh, one step too far. Okay, have a think too about what you're doing with the lights. Um, lights can be effective in certain ways. Now, if you're moving between bright sun and, and deep shade, then the light will help the bike show up. Um, but as we just mentioned, on, if you're riding in bright sunshine all the way, it probably won't be particularly effective. Um, one possibility is to add some extra lights. This is a so-called triangle of lights that many riders have been using recently. Um, there is some evidence that they can help on faster roads, possibly because the triangle kind of grows and gives the driver a better reference than just a single headlight coming towards them. Um, there's also some evidence they help drivers uh, spot motorcycles at night but they don't seem to work in collisions in built-up areas when the driver error happens very close up to the bike what does seem to be effective from some recent research um, is to change the color of the light on the bike if you think about it that makes sense because most cars these days are actually already equipped themselves with white day running lights so having something yellow on the bike uh, allows you to see that there's a different kind of vehicle coming and you don't need to go the whole hog and change the headlight like that you can just use a perspex headlight cover which is held on by velcro and peel it off at night so you've got full white light for lighting the road in front of you Okay, so the problem with all those is they are passive aids. They actually rely on somebody to see you and do something about it. Um, so what about doing something ourselves to try to take control of the situation? Well, the first thing we can do is we can lose some speed. Um, as you probably remember, if you double your speed, you quadruple your stopping distance. So the Maths works the other way. If you halve your speed, your stopping distance is now a quarter of where it was. Um, the other thing that you can try to do is use some lateral movement across the road to attract the driver's uh, visual attention towards you. Remember, peripheral vision pit tends to pick up movement. Um, the second thing to remember is that whilst we are mostly aware of problems with the vehicles emerging from the near side as in the picture it's not the only accident that we can have and in fact this one is the killer crash it's the oncoming vehicle that turns right across your path that one kills far more riders in the uk than are hit and killed by emerging vehicles so don't forget to look at both sides of the road. Right, that brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, I trust you've enjoyed it. I trust you found it useful. Um, the last thing I really want to say is that we're all human. We all make mistakes. And understanding errors and being prepared for errors, uh, whether they're our own or someone else's, really is the key to safer riding. So take it easy out there, enjoy your riding and stay safe. Thanks for watching. This is Kevin Williams of Survival Schools Rider Training. Bye for now.